Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the next instalment of the Dare Dallas webinar. Um, really nice to see everyone again, and thanks ever so much for people who tuned into the last webinar we did, which we had a, another fantastic response to. So thank you so much for getting in touch. If you do have any ideas about uh, a webinar that you'd like us to do, or any articles that you'd like us to do, please do get in touch, and uh, we'd be more than happy to try and help out. So today, I've been joined by one of my favorite people to talk to on the webinar, um, a countryman of my own home as well. So it's always nice to see you, Colin Fraser. How are you? Good afternoon. Very well. That's, that's quite a lead up now. I feel I've got the pressure on to really deliver here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Now, Colin, um, we've done a couple of these before, but obviously you're not such a common face on the Dare Dallas webinar as many people that I speak to most weeks. So, Colin, just tell us a little bit about yourself. I was became interested in silver through collecting and other mediums that sort of all led this story towards this idea of precious metals. Why are they precious? What are they? what has been made from them, what history and story do they, do, can they uncover? And I think I, from coins and other, other areas, I really fell into the more traditional silver of objects for the table, objects for design sake or, or show or, or status, because there's so much we can tell about them. And, and I won't say too much on that at the moment, hoping that our main conversation will do that. But I think when you break down these objects and, and ask yourself, you know, here's something I recognize, here's something I have in my home, or something that I used or understand. These things, they transcend generations. It's much like um, with coins. People are, love collecting coins and banknotes and stamps because we all know what those are. We all know how they, how they impact our lives, whereas we may not have grand classic cars or fantastic old master paintings, which we can appreciate but we have a very different relationship with, which I think with silver, um, you can really connect in with that. So it's been great fun. I've worked with museums, auction houses, valuing obviously is a big part of what we do and really getting to speak to collectors or people that have inherited silver or just bought it with a, with a, you know, a passion or an interest in mind. You always discover something new and hopefully I can help and pass something a bit different as well. So it's, it's great fun and hopefully we'll manage that today. So fingers crossed we don't let you down. Do you think, Colin, that one of the reasons that silver is, is so appealing to people as, as a collectible is not only are you buying something that artistically may be, you know, really interesting, but it's still usable, isn't it? And we're going to be talking about a bit of flatware today and, you know, some other bits and bobs. But do you think it's because you can still use it? You can have something that's 250 years old and it still has a practical value as well as, as, as an art value? I think absolutely. I think people can can have it on the shelf, they can have it in the glass cabinet, but equally when it's a fantastic family occasion or Christmas dinner, you can bring these special things out and use them. And most people do. I mean, there's some collections are maybe too precious or, or, or too valuable, but if you have a set of silver candlesticks, they can just live on the mantelpiece 350 days of the year, or they could be at the table for two, day, two days of the, of the year for Christmas dinner. So it is accessible. It doesn't have to be expensive. Lots of people think, oh, silver is going to be fortunes. But I argue, not always correctly, but argue that silver does have a very good value to it. You look at going to the high street, if you're on Bond Street, for example, or even somewhere like John Lewis or, or you know, Selfridges, somewhere like that, the price of new silver, because it's a valuable commodity in itself and the work that goes into it and the time is expensive compared to, in some cases, usable pieces of Victorian or even Georgian silver. And you've got 200 years of history. That piece from 200 years ago would have been the height of fashion of its days. These, these things are not made because they just want one. If you want one, you make it in a cheap material or, or it's going to be quickly made for a mass market, cheaper material, more quickly produced. Silver would have been the status symbol of its day. It would have been the brand new iPad, the new fancy iPhone with the three cameras, not the two camera lenses. These were things people respected. They realized what they were. It was the new car with the new number plate in the driveway. These were fashionable as much as they were utilitarian and usable things. And still we can, we can access all that even on 200, 300 years old. No, I, I totally agree. And um, I, I had a fantastic chat with uh, Jenny Knott, um, our jewellery and silver specialist, um, a couple of weeks ago with regards to, but she has a very, very soft spot for modern silver. And I totally, totally get the whole modern silver thing. And there are some fantastic items out there and some really good contemporary designers from, from the 50s onwards. But what I love about Victorian and Georgian silver is the fact that comparatively, it's a total bargain, isn't it? 
really is. It really is. You look at how much work, you take Victorian, quite often to be a lot more elaborate in design, a lot more of engraving or embossing, sort of 3D designs, chasing, things like that. Huge amount of time and energy and effort and skill went into that. And a lot of these pieces would have been made in a workshop, not to take that away from the craftsman, but it means that four or five craftsmen specialists in one area would be part of it. So even a 1940s cigarette box, which is a bit dented and a bit rubbed, and maybe got an inscription for a wedding present that's not that exciting, as now, would have taken a huge amount of work. There would have been the box maker, there would have been the hinge maker, there would have been the engraver, there would have been the wooden liner being made by a specialist. There are four people whose specialist skill is to do that. These are, these are specialist surgeons, not GPs, you know, and there's no disrespect there, but it's showing that this is absolutely the peak of production and people making a huge amount of effort. And as explained to me once now, he said, well, time and people, sadly, were cheaper in those days. We don't respect that in the same way now because we're not paying for that. You're paying for an object now. You're not paying to have it made. So to recreate even the simplest salver now would be arguably a lot more expensive than perhaps a Victorian copy would be, which has a life, a history and a provenance. Exactly. Now, the items we're going to talk today, if you haven't read Colin's article uh, before, it's going to be reissued. So, so we were all looking forward to that, Colin. Now, what are, we, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking this. I get a lot of jokes about this. People think I'm a, a geek, which I am, but, you know, maybe I try and hide it more than I'd like people to say that. But spoons, spoons are arguably the most commonly produced item in silver because they could, they could transcend the class system because you didn't have to have a lot of money to buy a silver spoon or a set of silver spoons. But equally, kings and queens still use silver spoons. And it's that idea that looking at an object, any object, but we've taken spoons for this example, can unravel a huge number of stories that don't just connect to places or to people, but to time, to political events that are happening. And in one simple little spoon, which I'm sure we could get a photo of on in a second, but one simple little spoon, hopefully we can unravel a, a rather large story that is a bit, a bit more grand than just somebody eating their porridge in the morning. So Colin, the first image we've got here what can you tell us about this? First point to make is there are six, not one, as I just showed you. That was a sort of a teaser entry there. But seven <laughs> they're silver gilt, so they're not gold. They look gold in colour on your screen, but they're, they're not. They're solid sterling silver, which is the standard of silver that's been used in Britain on and, on and off, but mainly since about 1066, um, if not So why, why did people actually do silver gilding then? status is the quick answer sometimes there's a function so if you've got a salt spoon and you are going to be putting the bowl of the spoon into the salt silver and salt don't get on and that will eat away at the silver over time again if you are having an egg and the sulfur in eggs doesn't match well with the silver um, and caviar as i'm sure all our viewers know caviar doesn't like to be touched by metal so you might use a, a mother of pearl bowl rather than a silver bowl, but with a silver handle. So in this case, it's purely status. It's absolutely status. Their function doesn't change because they're, they're silver gilt, but on a table under candlelight, that's going to give a really fantastic look as well. So these, obviously, they were a, a grand item for somebody to own. Now, I can't picture that these were used on a day-to-day -day basis for stirring your tea, were they? No, a bit bigger. So no, these are, we might call these a soup spoon size. They would be called a tablespoon in those days, but not meaning a serving spoon, it meaning a, a sort of above dessert spoon, smaller than serving spoon. So eating stews or soups and things like that. Um, they're very grand. And what I think is really interesting with silver is that whether or not it's the biggest piece that you've ever seen or the smallest piece, even down to cufflinks in my case today, um, they will be hallmarked. So all of a sudden, we and I've been a webinar on this before, so rewind on the YouTube channel and watch that, <laughs> too much of that. But, but from these spoons, from the marks that you can see on the stem, leading from the bowl up to the top of the handle, you can see there's a set of marks there. And from let me just Let me just get that image two seconds, yeah. Colin, and we can have a look at those four marks, can't we? Bear with us. And this starts us telling a story. This starts us being able to understand what we're looking at, which is more than just a set of six spoons. Now I can tell you, one, that they're made of silver, and I can tell that by the second mark from the left, so they look like a cat that's walking away from me. Uh, so I can tell you they're made of silver, that means they're sterling silver. 
which means there are 925 parts, 92.5% pure. Very rarely is silver made in, in, in pure silver because it's too soft and it would damage, but 925 was the standard of coinage that was carried forth from those early days. And that's the same now, isn't it, Colin? Absolutely. That's only changed once or twice. There are different standards as well. There are higher standards, but there are no lower standards in British silver. Some continental countries work more traditionally on 850 standards, so 85% silver or 800 or 900. But we've been very much around the, the 925 for, for centuries. Uh, the mark in the middle, as I see, is an S on its side. So you can just see the curves of an S and a little shield. That tells me these were made in 1733. So we know they're made in the reign of George II. So now we're, we're, we're getting on for 300 years old, which is it's just kind of mind blowing in a way. The mark to the right of the S, a bit harder to make out, but if you're a geek, you can see it. On its side again, there's a crown on the right hand side of the punch. That's a, the crown on top of the leopard's head. So that tells it was made in London. Every assay office of which in 1733, there'd have been full three in Britain at the time, there were up to about six at different periods, we'd have a different mark to say, this assay office, in this case, London, says this is silver, and we said it in 1733. So that's legally binding. That mark has the same legal validity today as it did in 1733. But more importantly- Just to touch on slightly on the hallmark thing, I know we've already done a webinar on this and it's, it's fascinating, but the main, the main point of it was uh, almost a taxation thing, wasn't it? It had two main strands. Taxation was a big thing because at different points, uh, different levels of tax were being levied on silver. Sometimes that was called duty and there'd be a specific duty mark a bit later than this. But really, it stems from consumer protection. So to this day, its function is still legitimate. It's still carried out. There is hallmarking happening all over Britain today, Edinburgh, London, Sheffield and Birmingham. And it's for your protection. So if you walk down the high street today, whether it's a Pandora charm at 50 or 60 pounds, or it's a thousands of pounds gold bracelet or gold pair of earrings in Cartier on Bond Street, they're going to be hallmarked legally to be sold in Britain, if whether it's silver, gold or platinum or palladium, the four, four precious metals, they have to be hallmarked. So you as the consumer know you're getting the standard of material that you're being marketed. And that was in 1733 and earlier and then later than that a bit. That was so you knew what wealth you had around you. Banks did exist, obviously, but were not necessarily trusted. So people put their money into something tangible, and silver was a very easy way to do that. I know that silver. You know that silver. The pawnbroker, the banker knows it's silver. We know what it weighs, so we know what it's worth. So again, you could recycle it. You could you could exchange it. If you had a good crop in your you know landed gentry farm, you buy some silver. If you had a bad crop, you melt some. It was a very good. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's great fun. And then again, I think the key is bringing people into these stories. These are spoons that obviously they were made for somebody. They were made by somebody, though. So the one mark we've not talked about on the far right is, is the WS. Um, that tells us the maker is William Soame, uh, who we know is in London. So now we're 300 years ago and we're looking into a man who we know his name's workshop. This has been made by William Soame, sent for hallmarking in London, 1733, and none of that changes to this day. And a lot of our colleagues would disagree with me, but there are very few fields of art and antiques where that is a guarantee, you know, often oh. opinion, or it's a, 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 it's, you know, it's a, we believe it's by this artist or the style of the painting, we think it's, it's this factory, or the, the porcelain's a bit bluer than it is whiter, so maybe it's bow rather than Worcester, you know, but this is a guarantee, and it's not just a guarantee, this is a legal guarantee. So I, I can be sure my facts are right on this one, which is great. It gives me great confidence to sit here and say that. So, Fantastic. Now, if we look at the spoons that we've got here, obviously there are some other details and markings on them as well, aren't there, Colin? Should we have Absolutely. a look at those and see what you can tell us about the other markings? Let's go to the top of the spoon. There's got the rounded end at the top. So these spoons, I didn't call, they're, they're called Hanoverian pattern. Now, pattern which, is, which is quite an old pattern, isn't it? Absolutely. Comes in in the early 1700s, so the early 18th century. Um, still made today. It's still popular. You, you still see it in stainless steel. Even if you look in, from Ikea, it's not that different. You know, it sort of follows that rounded pattern. Very simple, very classic, nicely weighted, nicely balanced. But it's called Hanoverian because it comes into its earliest incarnation is it comes in in the reign of the Hanoverian king, so the House of Hanover. And that's key. 
This engraving here is really where the, the story starts to be told. We know where it's made, when it's made and who made it, but now we know who it's made for, and that's even more important. So a lot of royal watchers out there would have spotted the royal motto in the garter, um, Oni Squawk O'Malley Pence, which is pronounced appallingly badly, but basically that <laughs> motto, Order of the Garter motto, but it's not, this is even more important, we have a crown above that. Now that crown is a royal crown, so it's not a ducal crown, it's not an earl's crown, a coronet. That tells us these are royal. Now these are spoons that are made for the royal family, not because of the Hanoverian pattern, but because of this. And in the centre, this is where a little bit of, um, of, of, of sort of blurred eye vision, like those old ninky ninkies magic eye posters. If you look very carefully in there, you can see a G and an R conjoined. So there's GR on one side, GR mirrored on the other side, uh, proving that it's, it's, these are from King George, King George II, as it would have been at that point, but from the service maybe to King George II. So all of a sudden from six spoons that look quite shiny and maybe modern, like a sort of Thai restaurant kind of gold cutlery to 300 years old, forgive me, 10 years worth of exaggeration, um, 300 years old, we know where, when, who they're made, but even more exciting, who they're made for. So these are relics of, 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 royal, of royal history, which is just... I think remarkable. So do we think that these were then part of a much larger set or do you think that these were just happened to be made for him as an individual kind of set or what, what, what would you say? These will certainly have been part of a much, a much larger service. Um, royals don't do things by half at this period. You know, we're talking really high, high period of, of, of royal power, let's say. Um, there would have been huge services. They had palaces dotted quite all over the place. And again, while they did travel with some silver, that would have probably been the more monumental pieces rather than more utilitarian. So these would probably have been part of a set of maybe four or five dozen or something like that. It was a huge service. Um, these six survived together, but, but that's, that's sort of, oh, there will be others and there'll be singles, but I don't know of any large groupings that still survive. But their story gets more interesting. We talk about provenance and we talk about how can we be sure these are George the George II? How can we be sure? One person I showed these to said, oh, these could be ambassadorial. So the, the tradition being, if you okay. are, so you are George II, let's say, so you send me out as your ambassador to Germany and I've got to represent you. So I have to have my own little court in Germany that is, is showing the British court to the, to the, to the hikes that you would want. So I would be given um, an allowance by silver and I'd be given some silver from the royal the royal collection in the jewel house but in that case more often it would have the royal cipher and crown but with my crest in the center or my arms in the center so that isn't the case we have here but there's one factor that really really knocks these out the park when it comes to provenance we'll go back a slide in a second to the hallmarks but because of the thing we'll show you in a second I can with great certainty give the provenance from being made in 1733 to being sold in 1924 and this is what I should have counted before I came on screen <laughs> and being owned by eight different monarchs so these have been the property of eight kings or queens that is remarkable isn't it and there is provenance to show that that's true there is so if we go back to the slide we had with the hallmarks our eagle-eyed viewers will I thought I missed a hallmark or, or forgot to describe something, which um, I will now... It's that little bit of script there, isn't it, Colin? Exactly, that little bit of squiggly at the end. Um, so hallmarks are struck in. So if you imagine taking a chisel with that little design that you see in the marks and hammering it in, whereas the, the three letters that you see to the far right of the spoon handle um, are engraved in. So engraving is where you would take a sharp tool and you remove metal, whereas with punches you're compressing metal. So much like you see at the end of Wimbledon or the British Open Golf, you always see the, the, the person there with a little engraving tool putting, you know, whoever wins it in whatever year. These have been engraved. Now, this, these three letters, they, I must remember, they are three letters, but they're also two massive fingers as well. They are two fingers up to the British royal family. Um, so we rewind a bit. We go back to 1733. These are commissioned by George II. Um, because they have this EAF on them, which we'll go into more detail in a second, we can be certain that they weren't in a British palace. They were in the palace of Pernhausen in Hanover, whereas Hanover was a, was a territory of Britain at the time. Obviously, the, the 
comes from the Hanabelian kings, and we had palaces there, we had the land there, and we had all the, all the rights that go with that. So we go further down the line. George II dies in 1760. George III comes on the throne. We're still kings of Hanover. So from 1760 to 1820, these would have been the property of George III. When he dies in 1820, George IV becomes king. They've got a real theme of names here. It's quite easy, this bit. George IV comes <laughs> in 1820, and he reigns till 1830. So unbroken provenance from 1733 to manufacture to 1830, it's 100 years, give or take, we can be sure. 1830, William IV comes on the throne, last of the Hanoverian kings. So here's where the problem starts. He dies in, seven, in 1837, sorry, and because his heir is Queen Victoria, the Salic law of Hanover meant that she could, as a woman, uh, not a very forward-thinking time, as a woman, she couldn't inherit the land, the title, and the rights to the Kingdom of Hanover, and had to for either forgo all rights, and, and Britain would keep the territory, or forgo the right of Hanover, and she would take the British, the British throne, which is obviously what she did. So, although she can't take the throne the, of Hanover, there are great questions about whether or not she can or can't keep the property, the land, just not the title. You know, you can you can be lord of the manor and not own the manor. And I think that's kind of what they were going for. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't really work. Her uh, sort of cousin, I suppose it is, Ernest Augustus, the first Duke of Cumberland, um, decides he's going to take the throne of Hanover and does, and frankly, sort of just takes it. Um, so he's very proud of this. He's, and it, but this becomes a huge royal rift. So we're talking about royal rifts that in a time when royals were untouchable. This is not a kind of Harry and Meghan and Megxit and God not mentioned Prince Andrew and all these things. This is when these were untouchable people. These people were, the, you know, untouchable as they could have. But he decides, no, he's, he, this is his right. And that's his belief. So he refuses to hand over the, 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 the wealth. He refuses to hand over the properties, the paintings, the art collections, the silver, many of which could be argued had come from Britain to decorate these homes. So it could be seen as they should be returned, even though the, the lands wouldn't. To such a degree that on all the silver which was in the palace, he engraves the EAF on, which is Ernest Augustus Fidencomus, I should say, was entitled to, or the estate of, so basically, two fingers up to Victoria and the British was going, no, no, these are mine, not yours. It doesn't matter yeah. what it says on the top, it matters what I say in the middle. Um, and basically took the whole lot. It got extremely, extremely difficult and apparently was very close to going to court. The thought of a royal being in court now with... It's not that unusual, is it, unfortunately? It was pretty outrageous at the time, but now is, well, you know, the Daily Mail could answer and the Sun could answer more than I could, but it's um, it's a very tricky thing. So it was a really difficult moment in, in British history, and, and also it, would have, it was the first time in, in hundreds of years, centuries, that there was a queen on the throne. We had changed right from the House of Whip to the House of Windsor. Uh, so it was a very difficult time, I'm sure, and this would have been a, an added pressure that wasn't necessary for a young queen. I think she ascends to throne, I think, age 18 or 19. You know, this is a young queen fighting the establishment. So all of a sudden, these spoons are now in, in 1837. We have this unbreakable provenance up to that point. And the Duke of Cumberland, Ernest Augustus, who is the king of Hanover, he dies in 1851. They're inherited by George V, king of Hanover, up to 1878. Ernest Augustus II, up to 1923. Ernest Augustus III, up to 19, uh, who was on the throne in 1923. He has a bit of a hard time financially, and they sell a lot of the a lot of the, the, the silver which had survived uh, the Russian wars and, and whatnot. They'd managed to hide all the silver and, and had been relatively intact, although they were sort of ousted as kings and became sort of Dukes of Brunswick rather than kings. And this mm -hmm. is, sorry, rather than kings. Um, and by 1924, they're, they're, they're sort of on their, on their last legs and decide that these have to be sold. And they are sold to Crichton Brothers. The, the, the English and British silver is sold pretty much en masse to Crichton Brothers of, of London and the Continental silver is sold to the East dealer as well. Would they have been sold at a premium because of their royal connection at this point? Or would they not have? Would it just be considered they just they just happen to be that? Absolute premium. I mean, there's at no point, I think, 
in history has a provenance not had a value. And at no point has a royal provenance been anything less than perfect. You know, anyone who's a collector or who's just interested in history is by buying something like this, they're not buying, well, they are buying six spoons, but they're buying a story. They're buying a connection. They're buying this idea that, that what they have in their collection or on their table, as you said before, you know, these things can be used, you know, is part of that great history. And we see that with auctions today, whether it's, you know, the Elizabeth Taylor auction or the Carl Lagerfeld auctions are starting soon as well. You know, these are great provenances, modern provenances, you know, movie stars, fashion designers, but it's part of that, that sort of aura of celebrity. And Royal is the beginning of that. You know, people always look up to the, to, to the Royal family and, and it's, it, it would have been fantastic. There was a bun fight to buy these things. I mean, these were- Well, I can imagine even, even in the 1920s, they, they would have been 200 years old by this point. And people were just still thinking, oh gosh, this, this is a great thing to be able to own, even in the 1920s. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, there was big monumental silver, there was big sets of candlesticks, even silver chandeliers, there was cups and covers, you know, massive, massive big things. Serving plates, meat dishes, soup terrines, you know, the full gambit that a royal court would need to, to dine and host. So lots of people would be getting part of this action. Crichton Brothers worked very closely with lots of museums, whether it was the Ashmolean, the Fitzwilliam, Victoria and Albert, some of the museums in the continent. So a lot of museums bought these provenances as well. So although there was quite a lot of the silver, a lot of it is now in museum collections because it not only is it wonderful examples of the object, because the Royals never bought second rate pieces, it's going to be the best, the best design, the best quality, the best age of silver. But these would have been the most fashionable things at the time too. You don't, you know, even today, the royals are trendsetters. You know, back then, they would be buying from the most fashionable makers in the most fashionable cities, making the most wonderful object. That, again, speaks volumes when in a, when in a private collection or an institutional collection. Do you think it was then, at this point, where these six spoons moved away from the rest of the collection? I imagine... Absolutely. Crichton Brothers were known to have bought a good number of them. They, I believe they sold a few larger sets, so maybe sets of 12, things like that. And then, of course, over time, they get split. They get sold into smaller packages. I know of a couple of single spoons that, that basically would appear to be from the same much larger service. But again, if you think most collectors might want, and that set of six is a nice round number. It makes it seem to be a serious set. 12 is a big number. 36, nobody needs you're going to use them six or 12 as a good number. So it makes sense that, that, that this sort of thing would be a great shame. More commercially viable to sell them in sets of six rather than a full canteen, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Although now it might be argued that selling them as six single spoons would be more commercially viable because obviously they're not they're not, not necessarily just of good value, but they're not cheap, let's say. But there are more collectors out there who would, could afford one than who could afford six. So sometimes there's that real pool for people. Do they keep them together or do they split them and make them into as, as, as many deals as possible, as many sales as possible? It would be a great shame, having survived, as we say, maybe 300 years, almost 300 years. So it would be a great shame to see them turned into uh, lonely, lonely, lonely brothers and sisters rather than a, a family. So. And how did you get hold of them, Colin? Believe it or not, they came out of a bank vault in London where it looked as if they'd been since 1954 as the newspaper they were wrapped in was... was wow. um, they'd been in the same family collection. Arguably, they may have bought them in 1924 from Crichton. So they may have come all the way from Hanover, got to Bond Street and, and stayed in the bank vault ever since. Um, and 